Good morning and Happy New Year. I read somewhere that today is the last day that you are allowed to wish someone a Happy New Year. Apparently after that it's no longer considered uh, polite. So for whatever it's worth, Happy New Year. This morning I want to start with a story about Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was an Australian psychologist who survived the death camps of Nazi Germany. And as he, as he lived there and succumbed to the horrific conditions, he made a startling discovery about why some survived those same conditions that he did and some did not. And so being a psychologist, he looked at several factors including health and vitality and the family structure, intelligence, survival skills. And finally, he concluded that none of those factors were primarily responsible. He said the single most significant factor he realized was a sense of future vision. The impelling conviction of those who were to survive that they had a mission to perform and some, un, some important work left to do. Survivors of, of prisoner of war camps in Vietnam and elsewhere have also reported similar experiences. A compelling future-oriented vision is a primary focus that kept many of them alive. So 2023 is behind us to some. That, that brings a little bit of excitement. Maybe you want to close the door on that chapter. Or to some, it might be bittersweet. There's things in 2023 that you enjoyed and you don't want to turn away from. There's events that took place in 2023 that shocked us. Take, for example, the surprise attack by Hamas on the nation of Israel. And there's some events in 2023 that intrigued us, or at least intrigued some of us maybe. If you follow the explosion of AI and ChatGPT and what that all meant for the world. But regardless of, of what things you remember from 2023, it is simply that, a memory. And your children and your children's children will learn about that in their history books someday. But now as we look on to 2024, and again to some, that it's exciting. There's new adventures, there's, there's new things. To others, it's maybe a little more daunting. Things you look forward to in 2024 don't seem quite as exciting, maybe. But regardless, it is a new year. It's a new chapter. Turn with me to Proverbs 29 for a text this morning. We're going to look at one verse. And you probably gathered that from the opening story about Victor. Proverbs 29, we're going to read verse 18. Solomon writes in Proverbs 29, verse 18, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You see, Victor, he understood something. A connection between a vision and a literal physical survival of people in death camps and prison of war camps. But Solomon also realized that as a wise king, that vision is necessary if a nation is going to be preserved. Because where there's no vision, he says, the people perish. And so you could make an argument this morning that a sermon devoted to vision is mainly towards leaders. And while I would agree that the responsibility of vision does fall primarily on leaders, there is an aspect that vision is important in the life of the individual. Vision is important in the life of the family, and vision is important in the life of the church. So this morning I want us to realize why vision is necessary, what is our vision, and how it is accomplished in our life. The title this morning, Your Vision, Your Destiny. What is vision? You get a classic Webster's um, definition of vision. You would read something like an, an unusual discernment or foresight. So that's what Webster's would, would claim this as. I'm not talking about the vision like, like Peter had a vision where, where the cloth that came out of the heaven. That's not the vision we're talking about. It's a, it's a foresight. A vision needs to be powerful enough to, to move people to action. But it also needs to be flexible enough that it can be reevaluated as time goes on. I believe vision is a, is a God-given desire for something that we not yet realize. It's something out there but it's not here yet, and it's, it's God-given. It's a sense of something that what should be or what could be, 
but is not yet here right now. It's a guiding force to a desired end. You want to get to a certain end, a certain goal, vision's what gets you there. It sees the path forward. Speaker Bob Logan says this. He says, the capacity to create a compelling picture of the desired. So that's what vision is. It's a compelling picture of what is desired. Which could be, should be, and that which is attainable. A godly vision promotes faith rather than fear. And a godly vision glorifies God, not people. The vision for your life, the vision for your family, the vision for your church... It needs to glorify God ultimately. And while God's going to use people to carry that vision out, a vision must glorify God. So why do we need a vision? Proverbs 29, Solomon said, no vision equals people perishing. Without vision, without foresight, without that that drive for something else, for something better, the people are going to perish. And so I think vision is therefore necessary as Proverbs lays out. Think back over the history of Israel, especially in the era of the kings. And you see that vicious cycle. Good king comes along, and there's an outcast of idols, outcast of idolatry. The high places are cut down. Worship is restored. There's peace. There's prosperity. And then a bad king comes. Idolatry is reintroduced. The, The high places are built up. Fighting and chaos occurs over and over again. I think it's clear what was the difference. What set apart a good king from a bad king? And yes, it was their spirituality primarily, but I think it was their vision. The good king saw something that what it could be. They saw the nation of Israel could be a powerful nation if they would follow God's way. The bad kings were all involved about themselves, what they could get out of it, what power, wealth, prestige they could pull from it. And so clearly the entire nation of Israel at that time, the spiritual temperature of the nation of Israel was directly linked to their leaders, the king, the people he had close to him, and the priests. And I think what I want to draw from that today is that the spiritual temperature of your home, the spiritual temperature of the church, is directly linked to the leaders, to the men. And that's what I'm calling. In the, in the home, it's a combination of the husband and wife. The church is a joint effort of the men. Charles Swindoll in his Chuck, in his, sorry, in his book, Make Your Dreams Come True, says this. He said, vision is essential for survival. It is spawned by faith, sustained by hope, sparked by imagination, and strengthened by enthusiasm. It is greater than sight, deeper than a dream, and broader than an idea. Vision encompasses vast thoughts outside the realm of predictable, the safe, and the expected expected. No wonder we perish without it. Vision is birthed. It's created in faith. Hebrews 11.1. 1, faith is a substance of things not yet seen. It's through faith that a vision is birthed. It's something we don't yet see it. It's not right here in front of us. But yet through eyes of faith, we see it. We sense what that vision is. It's through faith. And our vision, created in faith, sees the end and sees the path towards that end as well. Vision is sustained by hope. Not hope in my abilities. Not hope that my vision's strong enough. Not hope that my leadership is going to be able to fulfill this vision. It's hope in an almighty God, a sufficient God, a sovereign God who's going to see it to the end. A God who, who authors that vision and finishes that vision and will carry us through to the end. Visions are impacting. I sh- we talked about the kings of Israel. Let's look at a few Old Testament people quickly. What about Moses leading the group of Israelites? For 40 years in chaos and turmoil, through so much, he led the people. He saw what they could be. He led them to something, to a vision of a promised land. And at one point, he stood before God and said, God, you will not destroy this people. He had a vision of what these people could be and all their failings and shortcomings. He saw what they could be. What about David? He had a vision, a vision of that Goliath dead. And he saw that vision through. He said, it's not through me, it's through God. 
And God accomplished that vision. What about Solomon? He saw somewhere in his mind a vision of what the temple of the Almighty God should look like. And that vision sustained the work, sustained the effort, and brought it to completion. What about Esther? There is a vision that literally saved the entire nation of the Jewish people. Without her vision, the Jewish nation would be, would literally have perished, physically perished. And Nehemiah, can you imagine Nehemiah riding into Jerusalem with memories of what this city used to be like and the destruction and the chaos and the wickedness around him? And he had a vision of those walls being rebuilt. He had a vision of worship being restored in Jerusalem. He had a vision of peace and stability. I don't know if anyone else saw that vision but Nehemiah, but he saw it and he lived it out. What about in the New Testament? How about Peter preaching to thousands of people and thousands of people responding? Can you imagine the, the discipleship that would have had to happen? He saw it. He envisioned it. And he followed through. What about Paul taking the gospel to the wickedness of the Roman cities? And there, in that wickedness, he planted the church of Jesus Christ. And it grew and it prospered. That's a vision. What about the early Anabaptist leaders? seeing a need for something different, following the Bible, and seeing a vision of a, of a church that is operated by a group of believers. And while a good vision is impacting, the absence of a vision is also impacting. Look at the church at Ephesus that left its first love. Look at the church at Sardis, described simply in one word as dead. Or the church at Laodicea, described as lukewarm. What did they lack that the other churches had? Could it be that it was vision? Why do we not have a vision? Or why are visions not established? I'll give you two reasons this morning. One, materialism. The pursuit and the desire of physical things and, and tangible things dims our view of the spiritual things and our value of the spiritual things you see, materialism shifts our eyes off heavenly things, off spiritual things, and shifts our eyes down here to earth, to its issues, to its problems, to its value systems. And when we're no longer content with what we have, we become caught up in this greater and greater pursuit of something that we can hold in our hands, some form of, of happiness or some form of physical security that we can procure for ourselves. And while materialism may be the necessary vision for a, a budding entrepreneur to establish a budding or a profitable business, materialism in the life of the believer is devastating. It destroys vision. It destroys our, our desire for something better than what we're in. Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The second thing that I believe hinders us from having a vision or destroys a vision that is created is complacency. And I believe this simply summarizes the church at Laodicea. I'm sure the church at Laodicea, they started with the same longing, the same vision of a church planted in their city that would be growing and building up. However, somewhere along the line, they left their first love. They left it. Their vision fell dim. It was, they lacked a hunger. They lacked a thirst for God. Complacency came into their lives. And when we let complacency come in, we no longer have that hunger. We no longer have that thirst as a deer thirst for the water in Psalm 42. We no longer love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We just don't. And overall, it's just simply a, an uninterested view towards God. So what's the solution to these problems? What's the solution to these distractions? Two things this morning. One, and you're going to hear this a lot, but from John 15, abiding. Daily communion in the word. Daily communion with God, with Jesus Christ. Yearning for more and wanting more and more of what Jesus is. It's a deep connection with our Savior that we feel what he feels. We see what he sees. We have compassion for what he has compassion for. We move where he moves. His will is our desire. His vision becomes our vision. And we hunger and we thirst for deeper and deeper connection with him 
and a communion with him. He is all that we have. The second thing that I think will protect us from distractions, materialism, complacency, is disturbance. Sir Francis Drake was an English navigator, explorer, captain of a boat in the 16th century who circumnavigated the globe. And this prayer is recorded of Sir Francis Drake. He says, Disturb us, O Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we have arrived safely because we've sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, O Lord, when the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity, and in our efforts to build a new earth, we've allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, O Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. Drake understood that at times people become complacent. People become too enthralled with what the world has to offer and God needs to disturb us. God needs to shake us a little bit and say, there's something greater out there. There's something more that I want for you. And like I said, Sir Francis Drake, he circumnavigated the globe in mid to late 1500s. That's a man with vision. So how do we, how do we fight back? How do we resist the distractions of materialism and complacency in our lives? Abide in God, or in Jesus Christ, our strength, and allow God to disturb us when necessary. But what is our vision, or what should our vision be? I don't want this to be Drew's vision. I don't want this to be a vision that is set in stone, but simply to allow principles to be formed, to which, for which a vision can be formed upon. And it's a, it takes three forms, a personal vision, a family vision, and a church's vision. And while each one varies slightly from each other, there's a lot of overlap in these visions. And the one builds off the other. You see, a church's vision is only as strong, it's only as big, it's only as powerful as the vision of the families. A family vision is only as big, it's only as strong, it's only as powerful and as moving as the vision of the individual. And so for a church's vision to be Motivating for a church's vision to promote growth, it all goes back to the individual, the vision of the individual. But I believe there are two things that all three areas are going to be founded on, two principles. First one, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord our God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Every single aspect of your vision needs to be built upon that principle. Your personal vision, love the Lord your God. Your family vision, love the Lord your God. The church's vision, love the Lord your God. The second principle or foundational point I want to point out is taken from Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, often known as the Great Commission, where Jesus says to his disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Teach them to deserve all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Your personal vision, your family vision, and the vision of the church, I believe, are founded on those two principles of loving God and going and teaching and baptizing the nations. Our personal vision, turn with me to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6, verse 6. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? 
He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. I believe the vision of each individual person is founded off of this verse. To do justly, we should be known as honest people, upright men and women of integrity, fair. We're blameless, and we're known as good people. We don't show favoritism or, or bias. We're transparent. We're open. We don't operate in the dark. We're not shady. We do justly. Second, love mercy, kindness, gentleness, compassionate. Look at who Jesus associated with or who Jesus cared for in his ministry, the sick, those hurting from loss of loved ones, tax collectors, the scum of the Jewish society, the publicans and the sinners who no respectable Jew would be found in association with. That's who Jesus associated with. That's who he ate with. That's who he talked with. I believe Jesus is calling us to do the same. We offer mercy as we receive mercy. We pour out grace and kindness as we have received grace and kindness from Jesus Christ. Walking humbly with thy God. It's growing in grace and in knowledge day after day, abiding. See, that word's going to come up a bunch. Abiding in Jesus Christ, walking with him every single day and continually growing. It's a humbled surrender and a willing attitude toward our Savior. And so from Micah chapter 6, I believe our vision as individuals is to glorify God in all areas of life, to do justly, love mercy, to love and walk with God while telling others the gospel message and that salvation is available to all. What about our family vision? Turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12 is God's call to Abraham. And if I could have God's call to, my, to me and my family as clear as what he gave it to Abraham in these three verses, I'd probably etch it in stone somewhere and keep, a, keep a hold of that. God gave Abraham a call. He gave him a vision of what his life was going to be like, his family life. And I believe this sustained Abraham, or in, at this point in his life, Abram. So if you're with me in Genesis 12, we're going to read the first three verses. And now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. I believe an integral part of every family vision is the aspect of being a blessing. God has blessed us not so that we can be happy and content, not so that we can relish in all that we've been given, not that we can just sit back and say, thank you, Lord, but he has blessed us, he has blessed our families so that we in turn can be a blessing to others. And that's God's way. Blessed people bless others. A family vision should be a blessing. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Why? So that you, in turn, will be a blessing. Obviously, as, as children come along, so does responsibility of training and discipline becomes an, a very important part of our family vision. Where do we want our children to be? Not that we put our children into a box and say, you will be this, your job will be this because of what this is going to be. But it's a sense of what your children could be. And you're going to do everything possible to get them to that point. Whatever it takes. Pushing them. And when they see that mom and dad have a vision, they're going to catch that vision. They're going to follow through with that vision, I believe. Also, families need to be involved in the work and mission of the church. Children are not a hindrance to the mission of the church. Children are not a hindrance to the work of the gospel. I believe children actually further the impact of the gospel and open up more doors. And so I believe the vision as families is to be a channel through which God can bless others as he blesses us, to train and discipline our children according to the Bible, and to join hands with the local church to further the mission of the church in raising disciples for Christ. 
the vision of the family. And finally, the church's vision. I believe it's threefold. One, worship. Two, discipleship. And three, evangelize. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2.9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Why? A peculiar people. Why? Why would God bestow such importance, such mercy, such blessing on a people who he knows are going to turn on him, who knows are not going to follow through at times? Why? That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The church's vision should be one of worship. For all that he has given us, for given his life on the cross and his sacrifice that he has done, we in turn worship. We worship through our work. We worship through singing. We worship through our lives. Every aspect we worship. Number two, discipleship. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, we're going to read a number of verses here. And I believe this lays forth the, the principle of discipleship for the church. And part of its threefold purpose and vision. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to start reading at verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Why is he giving gifts? Why is he giving all these things and all these talents and abilities to people? So the church is discipled, the church is grown, so the church is edified. So the church can be the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm not sure I quite grasp that. But the church is to be the fullness of Christ. But that's why. For the perfecting of the saints, all the parts join in to the perfecting and the edifying, and the furthering of the mission of the church. The church is called to unity, all together, and to together seek this fullness of Christ. The third aspect is evangelize, taken from the Great Commission. Or as Steve Saint said in his book, who's a son of Nate Saint, the martyr missionary, he titled a book, The Great Omission. And if you've not read that, I would recommend it. But... The Great Commission by Jesus Christ, go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. And I believe that is the third aspect of the church. Recognizing that Jesus is with us, his authority undergirds all we do. We are not alone in our work of evangelism. Zach, in your sermon on why church, you also gave a threefold vision. Threefold vision of addicted to the work of the church from 1 Corinthians 16. Also a vision of all members feeling a sense of belonging from Mark 3, where Jesus said, these are my brothers, these are my sisters. And he pointed to those around him. And also a sense of connection from Acts 14, where there's a safe place, open communication, transparent with all members. And so I believe the church's vision is to worship God, disciple others, and spread the gospel of hope to all while operating in a unified body, towards the same goal, the mission of the church. So how is the mission accomplished? We see the need for, or a vision, sorry, how is a vision accomplished? We see the need for vision, we develop a vision, but how is it accomplished? How is it fleshed out every single day? I have three principles. The first principle, I've said it before, abiding. And I believe this is so, so important. 
abiding. To develop a vision, we need to be abiding. It's not our vision. It's given to us by God. It's we need to abide in order to get that vision. In order to develop a vision, to evaluate a vision, we need to be abiding. And to carry forth the vision, we need to continue to be abiding. Jesus is our vision. He is our strength. He is our courage from when we don't see the vision much anymore and the perseverance and the hope to carry it on. All of these are necessary if we are to live with vision. Principle two, trust and faith. A vision may seem unattainable in man's eyes. A vision may be mocked or scorned by those who do not have vision. A vision requires trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own abilities. Don't lean on your own uh, talents. Trust in the Lord to accomplish that vision. He gave you that vision. He's going to carry it forth. And also faith. When, the, when others don't see the vision, and you do, through eyes of faith, you know it's there. You have evidence. You see it. Carry forth that vision through trust and faith. And finally, the third principle, brotherhood accountability. Proverbs 27 and verse 17, iron sharpeneth iron, and so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. I believe brothers and sisters in the church can help us form a vision, can help us as we shape our vision, can help us as we evaluate our vision, and also help us stick to our vision. When I have misaligned priorities and my life drift from my vision, my brothers can help me align Drew, where's your vision? What's your focus? That's what accountability is. It's keeping us aligned where we want to go. And I believe this applies for the vision, a personal vision, applies for a family vision, applies for a church vision. We come alongside, and together we fulfill our visions for the honor and glory of God, our Savior. And so this morning, I believe vision's necessary. We saw that. Vision's necessary if we are going to survive. We're going to thrive in our journey here. However, Materialism, complacency, they're going to distract us from our vision. They're going to hinder us from establishing a vision and carrying forth that vision. But if we abide in Christ and allow God to shake us when he needs, to disturb us when things are going a little too good for us, we will strive for completion of our vision. So this morning I gave very broad visions for a family, for your personal lives, and for a church. I don't mean this to be adapted and stamped in stone. I rather want it to be a, a foundation through which you can then build your own vision off of. Because I believe we all need a vision. And while these principles apply to all, your vision for yourself, your vision for your families, your vision for your role in the church, it's going to be unique to you because God's a unique God. He's a personal God. He's going to speak to you as you ask for a vision. In all three areas of, of vision, personal, family, church, we're all united on a singular goal, again, loving God and making disciples of all nations. A vision is only impacting, it's only powerful if it promotes the action. If you have a vision but you don't follow through on it, then your vision needs to be reevaluated. And I believe if we are going to be moved to action and just move towards our end goal, again, abide in Christ trust and faith in our Savior and allow for brothers and sisters to speak into your life and ask you questions about your vision. So God bless you in this new year. God bless you as you look at what 2024 means to you. It's a time of, of reflection, a time of looking forward as well. And what I want all of us to do is simply allow God to cast a vision in your life. A life, what's God asking you to live? And while it's based off of, for example, Micah 6 and others, it's going to be a little bit different for each one of us. But ask God, God, what is your vision for my life? And husbands and wives, I think we need to together ask, God, what's your vision for our family? And men, we need to ask, what's the vision of the church here at Myerstown? God's going to speak. He's going to give us a vision. And through, that vision may seem daunting, it may seem big, but God's going to see it through. And so as you go forth in 2024, and first of all this week and this month, may God grant you a vision. May God grant you the joy 
of the Lord as you serve him. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning. And Father, we ask that you would give us a vision. Lord, you know each one of our lives individually. You started our lives. You called us to yourself. And Father, I ask now that you would give us a vision of what you would have for our lives. Father, what's your vision for our families for this year and the coming years? And Father, what's your vision for the church here at Myerstown? As we continue worshiping, discipling, evangelizing, Lord, would your will be done, may your name be glorified in all aspects of our vision. This is not for our glory, this is not for our name, our promotion. Rather, Father, this is for you. And we ask that you would speak, and that we would be able to listen, and that we would carry forth the vision that you would give to us. In your name, amen.